I'm going to take this off the mic stand if that's okay. You guys hear me okay? What's that? Right in there. Can you hear me now? Great. All right. So Richard asked me to give a talk on the roots of wider outreach. And then gave me a Bible verse. I'm not going to tell you the Bible verse because that's going to then ruin everything else. But he gave me a topic of roots of wild roots of wider outreach. Um, and when I think of roots, I think of trees. Uh, I love trees, not just like being around trees. I actually love trees. When my wife and I bought our first house, the first spring I went through a fruit tree catalog and bought half a dozen fruit trees and I've continued to plant fruit trees uh, in our yard for the past 15 years. Um, if you remember uh, Mark and Dee Martin, uh, they knew I liked fruit trees. When Mark's father passed away, they said, hey, we've got all of these baby walnut trees, come over and have one. And so I came over to his father's house, dug out, a uh, walnut tree that was about this big, and it's now about 20 feet in the back of my yard. Um, this last spring, I helped Jake and Christina Collins. I love trees, but I occasionally have to cut them down. I helped them cut down two trees out of the backyard. That was a lot of fun. Two and a half trees. We started cutting a tree that we weren't supposed to cut, <laughs> so two and a half trees. Um, I am really proud. This spring, I sent pictures to my family because I have a persimmon tree, an Asian persimmon tree that has started fruiting. I've tried to grow Asian persimmons for 15 years. I've tried five separate varieties. I finally have fruit on a tree. I am, I was ecstatic. Like when I saw the fruit, I actually grabbed Ashley, didn't tell her what was going on, said come to the backyard right now. And I pointed at this little itty bitty green thing on her tree and said that's actual fruit. Um, and I've tried five different varieties. All of them failed, and I finally have a fruit tree that's, that's actually growing um, that is an Asian persimmon. What's interesting is I find trees to be easy to grow. You put them in the ground, you water them, they grow up, you prune them. They grow, you prune, you grow, you prune. And I think they're easy to grow because of God. Uh, turn over to First Genesis. Genesis for chapter 1. <laughs> Technically, first Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation. I'm reading from the um, CSB. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and fruit trees of the earth bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed bearing plants according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning the third day. Day four was light. Day five, fish and sea creatures. Day six, livestock and man. And then in chapter 11, verse 28, it reads, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seeds. This will be food for you. We have trees that grow the way they do because of Genesis chapter 1. Because they produce seeds of their own kind that we can turn around and plant. What's interesting about that passage in, in chapter 11. Did I say chapter 11? I meant chapter 1, verse 28. Did you, did you catch that? All right, good. Chapter 128, um, what they were, what I find interesting here is it says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. It's not just enough for us to grow trees. 
we also have to subdue God's creation. And a great example of that are apples. Okay? When, when you take an apple seed, you, my son loves Granny Smith. I don't know why. They are tart, but he loves green apples. Every single time he sees green apples, I want a green apple. If I were to take a Granny Smith seed and plant it in the ground, I would not get a Granny Smith apple. Apples are heterozygous. In the same way that I have two sons, Ashley and I are the parents, they are not twins. One has blonde hair, one has brown hair. One likes lettuce, one doesn't. <laughs> They're both ticklish on their feet, okay? Apples are the same way. When an apple seed is created, it's like rolling a genetic lottery like you do with your children. And so if I were to plant a, an apple seed, a Granny Smith apple seed in the ground, I'm most likely going to get what we call a crab apple. It's, it's going to bear fruit. It's going to have the shape of an apple. It might not be the same color. It might not be the same size. It might not be the same taste. But it's going to bear some fruit. As a people, as a society, we have subdued apples by planting hundreds of thousands of trees and waiting for one to prop up that tastes good. How many people have had a Cosmic Crisp or a Honey Crisp? Those were both created by a university out of Washington where they just planted hundreds of trees. They wait tens of years for them to, to grow. They take an apple, they bite it, and they're like, oh, this is terrible. Cut the tree down. <laughs> and they continue to do that again and again and again until they get the varieties like Honey Crisp or Cosmic Crisp. And what do we do then? We eat them, but we cut small branches off of them, and we graft them onto trees like the crab apple. So that the crab apple stock ends up creating honey crisp trees. Does that make sense? As a people, we've taken nature and we've subdued it according to what God has asked Adam to do in Genesis chapter 1. The apple's a great example of that. Um, Needless to say, I think there are a few first principles in Genesis chapter 1. One, God commands all creation to be fruitful and multiply. Two, it is man's job to su subdue that creation uh, for the benefit of man and for the glory of God. Now, let's take Genesis chapter 1. Take it out of the Old Testament, and I want you to put it inside of the gospel. What happened in Genesis chapter 1 in the first seven, six days? God created the earth and all creation. Uh, all the fish, all the birds, all the uh, livestock, the earth itself, life, man. What has Jesus done during the gospel? He came to earth, and it's easy to say he's built the church. For those three years of his ministry, he's built uh, the reputation. He's used miracles to, to bring people to him. He's taught them. He's, he's brought up men uh, to take on the charge of spreading the gospel. And in Matthew 28, Jesus has parting words. In the same way that God has parting words for Adam and Eve, Jesus has parting words for the disciples. Matthew chapter 28. Turn with me there. You know probably where I'm going with this. Matthew 20, 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. In Genesis... Authority was given to man to subdue the earth. Jesus is saying, that authority is, is now mine. Go, therefore, don't be fruitful and multiply. 
But go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all the, that I commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. When we talk about roots of wider outreach within this body here, we're being called to do something that God called his creation to do, called his creation to do from day one. To produce of like seed and like kind forever. God said, you animals, you plants, produce for yourself of like kind. And what's interesting, Jesus is asking us to do the same thing. Where God's creation, his act of creation comes to an end, he sets those principles. Jesus is just about to leave the earth and go to heaven. And what he says is, go into all the nations and teach them what I've taught you. And what's also, teach them to teach others what I taught you. And teach them to teach others what I taught you. It's not a one generation thing. You're going to teach them to go and do this as well. I think what's interesting is we are all here because of the roots of the Great Commission. Recognize we're here because someone took that first principle and taught somebody about the gospel. For me, someone taught my dad. Before him, someone taught my grandma. Before him, someone taught her dad. We are an interconnected organism of people that have been taught according to what was asked of us in Matthew chapter 28. So instead of just creating more fruit trees, God has asked us to create more followers. It's that root of the gospel that bore fruit in you for why you're here tonight. That's my thought for this evening, something to chew on as we continue to talk about roots and outreach. Understand that's where it came from. The roots of our faith came from this one verse in chapter 28 when he told 12 men, go and preach the gospel. Teach them to follow everything I've commanded, and I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. I didn't turn it off.